Kim Jones, Kimberly Jones, National Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C. From Wall Street to Washington, the Chester Dale Collection. In February 1930, the, Ameri uh, the art critic Helen Appleton Reed began a series of articles in Vogue magazine devoted to famous American art collections. Collecting has become a major American hobby, she observed, noting that most recent collectors sought out what she called contemporary 19th century art. For her inaugural piece, Reed selected Chester Dale. Left. Am I doing the wrong? No. Just read. Keep walking. Yes. Yes. There we go. Um, for an inaugural piece, Reed selected Chester Dale, and she could not have found a better example of this trend or more colorful subject. Dale, an investment banker who made a fortune on Wall Street, and his wife Maud, herself an artist, had assembled a collection that Reed heralded as one of the most important in America in terms of 19th and 20th century French painting. The Dale Collection, built on Chester's enthusiasms and business acumen, and Maud's discernment and expertise, was celebrated both for the quality of the individual works and for their combined scope and character. Dale applied his considerable skills in financial gamesmanship and cutthroat deal-making to the art market to great effect, and at times, the consternation of contemporaries. Upon his death in 1962, the bulk of his collection was donated to the National Gallery of Art, where it would become the foundation of the museum's collection of modern art. But his mandate that his paintings could never be lent had the unfortunate effect of limiting their visibility and consequently devaluing his own role as one of the most influential collectors of his time. Dale's career as a collector began in 1918. Initially, he focused on works by contemporary American artists such as Robert Henry, Guy Penn Dubois, as well as George Bellows, the latter of whom was a neighbor of the Dales in New York and painted their portraits at Dale's request. He regularly made the rounds of the New York art galleries and developed what he later characterized as the very bad and very expensive habit of attending the picture sales in New York auction rooms. He also began to make his first forays into the acquisition of French 19th century painting, although the earliest acquisitions were fairly uh, conventional. In the autumn of 1925, the Dales traveled to Paris, starting a tradition of annual excursions to France to collect art, where Maud's knowledge of the Paris art scene, as well as her fluency in the language, proved invaluable. Following their return to New York, the Dales plunged into the domain of avant-garde art for the first time, acquiring the plumed hat by Henri Matisse from the Crochet Gallery in New York in December of 1925. This was a bold move for the novice collector. Although well-established in France and patronized by more experienced and adventurous American collectors, such as John Quinn, the Cohn sisters, and Albert Barnes, who will be hearing about tomorrow, Matisse had not yet shed his outlaw reputation sufficiently to be embraced by the ma mainstream American art, uh, mar art market. In 1920, um, th that the Dales were purchasing works by Matisse at such a relatively early date, they acquired two more paintings by Matisse in 1926, is a testament to their increasing willingness to take risks as collectors. By the time of Matisse's solo exhibitions in Paris and New York in 1931, which established him as an unquestioned giant of modern art, the Dales owned 10 of his works, including Lance, oops, oh, these are other Matisse collections, um, including uh, Landscapes and Still Lives, and of course, these beautiful seductive Odalisque paintings, placing the Dales firmly in the ranks of the artists most important American collectors of the 1920s. The acquisition of the plumed hat marked a clear turning point for the Dales. Any lingering reserve was gone by the time they returned to Paris the next spring. Now that Maud recognized Chester's interest in collecting art was more than a casual hobby, she suggested that he channel his efforts into building a more coherent collection focused on French art of the past 150 years plus antecedents, uh, what she called the ancestors, old masters such as El Greco and Boucher who were relevant to modern art. Chester was happy to follow her lead. 
She had the knowledge, I had the acquisitiveness, Dale often stated, and the result was a very formidable partnership between the two. During their sojourn in Paris, Maud arrived in April 1926, Chester joined her in May, Dale purchased avidly with a strong emphasis on 19th century painting, especially works by the Impressionist. The preponderance of Impressionist paintings among these early acquisitions can be attributed to Chester's taste as much as Maud's. In his unpublished memoirs, Dale recounts how Maud took him to the Louvre to look at French paintings when they arrived in Paris as part of her ongoing project to educate him in the history and virtues of French art. While she favored the 18th century masters, it was the collection of Isaac de Commando that he had donated to the Louvre in 1911, which Sylvie discussed yesterday, that was the, with the centerpiece being 62 modern French paintings by Cézanne, Degas, Manet, Monet, Sicily, and Toulouse-Lautrec, that in Chester's own words made him sit up and take notice. The impact of these paintings, installed together in a suite of galleries bearing the donor's name, would stay with Dale for the rest of his life. Commando's taste is evident in the works that Dale acquired in the second half of the 1920s, not only in the artists he favored, but also in the subjects and compositions themselves. Works by Degas, you see on the left. Um, of course, the first of his two Rouen cathedrals, very much inspired by the four acquired by Commando, and even a Houses of Parliament that he purchased, very similar to the one that Commando owned. Although it is evident that he followed Commando's example, he did not do so slavishly, expanding his repertoire considerably. He began to collect works by the American-born Impressionist painter Mary Cassatt, 25 works in total, including nine paintings and an entire suite of her exquisite Japanese-inspired color prints. He also bought paintings by the post-Impressionists, um, including five by Van Gogh, five by Gauguin, along with two wood sculptures by Gauguin, relative anomalies in Dale's collection, which was focused almost exclusively on paintings. A half a dozen works by Paul Cezanne, excluding his, uh, one of his most beautiful uh, still life paintings, The Peppermint Bottle, and um, half a, a total of 25 works by Toulouse-Lautrec in a variety of media, both paintings and prints. He also began to acquire works by contemporary artists, some of them in significant numbers. In September 1927, he purchased Peonies, the first of six paintings by Georges Braque to enter the collection, and a relatively recent painting. During their sojourn, to, oh, excuse me, that year he also purchased the first of five paintings by Maurice Vlaminck, as well as his first eight canvases, first of eight canvases by André Derain. Dale and his collecting activities were making a splash on both sides of the Atlantic as the triumphs at the Paris auctions were reported in the press. The sheer number of purchases and the dazzling sums he paid generated such headlines as Dale adds three more paintings to the gallery, or New Yorker buys Claude Monet painting at Hotel Drouot paying 200,000 francs, which announced the acquisition of the Houses of Parliament. Maud played a key role in promoting the Dale collection through several innovative exhibitions of her own that featured the art that she and Chester had been acquiring. Of particular note was her lone exhibition of modern French art from the Chester Dale collection, organized at the Wildenstein Galleries in 1928 to benefit the French Hospital of New York. This marked the first time that the Dale collection was presented publicly as a cogent and distinct collection. With more than 300 paintings, the Dales had established what was recognized at the time as one of the most important and representative collections of modern art in America. A snapshot of its character can be seen in Maud's book, Before Modi Manet to Modigliani, published in 1929, and illustrated with 103 works by 56 artists spanning 150 years of French painting, opening with the classicism of Jacques-Louis David, continuing through the realism of Courbet and onto Impressionism and post-Impressionism, and culminating in the contemporary art of Matisse and Modigliani, strongly emphasizing artistic tradition across generations. Maud's book, like the Dale collection itself, also revealed very distinct predilections. One was her partiality for portraiture. Portraits, she explained in the introductory text, are the documents by which not only the individual, but his epoch, can be recreated. In portraits, one is permitted to view the passing show. 
and the images they present of life and art, we catch again the echo of their times as they follow each other across the century. In addition, the book made clear the artists favored by the Dales at this point. Cezanne, Degas, and Toulouse-Lautrec, each represented by four works, Gauguin, Matisse, and Renoir with five. But it was Modigliani, Amadeo Modigliani, with no fewer than eight canvases. Uh, here, showing you the Renoir, Gauguin, and Modigliani, with no fewer than eight canvases who dominated them all. Modigliani was indeed a particular favorite of the Dales, though he was a relative unknown when they first began to acquire his works. Chester, by his own admission, did not initially appreciate the artist, but he was ultimately brought around by Maud's impassioned explanations. Purchasing five pieces by Modigliani in 1927, another six the following year, the Dales eventually amassed 21 of the artist's works, among them 16 paintings, four works on paper, and one sculpture, to form what was quickly recognized as perhaps the finest selection of Modigliani's art in existence. The Dales' examples of this difficult painter are remarkable, and to see them all together, as when the collection is intact, is to come much closer to an understanding of what Modigliani sought, observed a critic in the New York Times in 1928. Maud, in particular, um, was a proved a devout and tireless supporter, organizing exhibitions, publishing texts, including the first English language monograph on the artist in 1929, while critics decry the artifice and distortion of Modigliani's style, Maud praises simplicity and dramatic energy. Not surprisingly, it was the portraits she most admired, declaring them to be the most direct, the least involved art statement that has emerged from all the emotional searching that broke out at the beginning of the 20th century. By the 1920s, modern art was slowly finding wider acceptance in America, with several public and semi-public collections established for its promotion, and presentation, including the Phillips Memorial Gallery in Washington in 1921. And there you see that wonderful luncheon of the voting party that we saw yesterday. The Barnes Foundation in Marion, Pennsylvania in 1925, founded by Albert Barnes. And of course, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which opens its doors in 1929 with an inaugural exhibition featuring works by Cezanne, Gauguin, Van Gogh, and Georges Seurat. Dale, incidentally, was one of the 14 original trustees of the museum and a lender to the inaugural exhibition. Private collectors, too, were embracing modern art as never before. According to the American Art Dealers Association, American collectors spent nearly $250 million on fine art in 1929, or nearly $4 billion in today's currency, two-thirds of which was devoted to modern art from both the United States and abroad. Dale was among those signaled out for his lavish expenditures. 1930, however, would mark another turning point in Dale's collecting. Although Dale had been collecting on an upward trajectory, he acquired 125 works of art in 1929 alone, many of them in the five-figure range. His strategy was now focused upon the acquisition of major works by major artists. His clear goal, though never explicitly stated, was to build a prestige collection that would attract international attention. To achieve that end, important works by Picasso were essential. Picasso is, for present, the idol of collectors of modern art, proclaimed the New York Times in 1930. And it was a belief that Dale embraced wholeheartedly. Eight of the 12 paintings by Picasso that ultimately entered the collection did so between the years 1930 and 1938, four of them blue and rose period works. The timing behind this shift in collecting strategy was not coincidental. Like all his contemporaries, Dale did not escape the impact of the stock market crash in October 1929. But while most collectors curtailed their activities, Dale did precisely the reverse. Despite heavy financial losses, he spent between $300,000 and $500,000 in pictures in Paris in the summer of 1930, according to his friend, the art critic Henry McBride. For Dale, a man who amassed a personal fortune by gambling on stocks, the slumping art market offered unprecedented opportunities for an individual with the means to purchase and the drive to push forward. Dale continued what had become his regular practice over the previous decade of traveling to Paris each spring on the hunt for art. Dealers pursued him constantly, offering him advantages that he was more than happy to exploit to his own benefit. When he wished to see the private collection of the dealer Paul Rosenberg, 
renowned for his important collection of works by Brock and Picasso, for example, he was granted entree, whereas others were not. For the Chesterdales, uh, McBride observed, all doors were open. Dale, of course, had been a steady customer of Rosenberg since 1927, buying primarily Impressionist works by Cassatt and Cezanne. In the spring of 1930, however, Dale outdid himself. Between May 15th and June 5th, he acquired nine paintings from Rosenberg, including five by Picasso, including The Tragedy, The Two U's, A Still Life, and The Classical Head, and Madame Picasso. The critic Murdoch Pemberton later recounted a visit to Rosenberg's gallery. Dale took a quick look around. He was in fine fettle. Some he liked, some he didn't. No long, obtuse, and meaningless phrases are used by Dale, as is the custom with most people when they look at art. Dale knew his reactions. He inquired the prices. He scratched his head a moment. And then he said, I'll take that and that. Total cost $75,000, as you or I would buy neckties. The following year, the Dales acquired an undisputed masterpiece for the collection, The Family of Saltenbanks, one of the artist's largest and most ambitious compositions. Dale recounted in his memoirs that he had purchased the painting, then locked away in a Swiss bank account as, a Swiss bank as collateral, sight unseen, based solely on a photograph and the strength of the recommendation from the dealer Valentin Duduzang. It was an extraordinary gamble, but Dale had built both his fortune and his collection through risk taking. He had good instincts when it came to a deal, and they served him well in this case, allowing him to buy the work for the staggering lo low sum of $20,000, or about $300,000 in today's dollars. Characteristically, the Dales also proved themselves adept at stirring up publicity. No sooner had the painting arrived in New York than it was unveiled in Maud's latest exhibition at the Museum of French Art, Picasso, Brock, and Leger, where it became the star of the show, even making the cover of Art News. The sensation of the event is the large Picasso, the, the La Famille des Saltenbanques, recently purchased by the Dales through the Ballantine Galleries for its price of $50,000. Dale was no doubt delighted by the speculation around the painting, which afforded him the secret pleasure of knowing he had gotten a masterpiece at a bargain price, while allowing him to appear like a big spender in public. Decades later, these tales persisted. In 1955, Fortune magazine reported that Dale had purchased the painting for 1 million francs, double what Dale had actually paid. Maud, for her part, published another monograph, this one devoted to Picasso, which much like her book to Modigliani, prominently displayed works from the Dale collection, serving to further promote the works to an ever-expanding audience. And you can see that Picasso himself even signed um, an, the book for the Dales as a gift for Chester. Although the Dales enjoyed publicity, they maintained tight control over the display of their works, rarely lending to exhibitions that were not organized by Maud. The most striking example of this came in 1932, when the Galerie Georges Petit hosted a major exhibition of Picasso's work. The opening event was a glamorous affair, according to contemporary accounts, and the Dales were in their element. To commemorate the event, Picasso even inscribed a dedication on their copy of the catalog, along with the drawing, you see here. While their participation in the show was not unexpected, their decision to lend only a single painting, the two U's, certainly was. And the absence of the family of Saltenbanks and their most, their most recent acquisition, and a, a work that had been garnered so much attention, was particularly conspicuous by its absence. The decision is all the more surprising because Dale was a shareholder in the Galerie Georges Petit, then owned by Etienne Bignou, who acted as Dale's primary art agent, as well as Gaston and Jos Bernheim Jeanne, and had been on its board since 1928. This was not an isolated incident, however. The Dales proved reluctance to lend to Picassos and did not participate in the major Picasso exhibitions held at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in 1934 or at MoMA in 1939, 1940, and 1957. A. Everett Austin, the director of the Wadsworth Athenaeum, approached the Dales about contributing to his show, but Maud refused to lend the painting they wanted, the Faltenbanks and the juggler was still life, offering the more modest classical head instead. Austin declined at any further negotiations. Although not known at the time, the Georges Petit exhibition in 1932 was the last time a work from the Dale collection would be seen in any Picasso exhibition outside of the National Gallery of Art. 
The Dales were now actively grappling with the question of where and how to share their collection, even as it and the public's interest continued to grow. High profile acquisitions and the occasional loan of discrete segments of their collection had kept their name in the news. But it was only within the walls of the Dales' private residence that one could experience a collection in its full glory. In 1933, Chester purchased a majestic five-story townhouse at 20 East 79th Street uh, with sufficient space to display their prize paintings. And a tour of their home became a coveted invitation for any serious lover of modern art. Visitors come from Paris, Berlin, and Moscow to have another glimpse of Monet's Rouen Cathedral, or perhaps a peasant girl by Van Gogh, remarked one commenter, noting, the apartments usually look more like the Louvre than a home. In contrast to his contemporary Albert Barnes, who famously limited access to his collection, Dale delighted in welcoming visitors, connoisseurs and friends alike, entertaining a who's who of contemporary art world, as well as the occasional celebrity. In later years, when much of Dale's collection was on long-term loan to various institutions, and Chester had moved into more modest lodgings at the Plaza Hotel, a visit to his private quarters still remained a special treat. The best remembered thing about Chester Dale's apartment, wrote the art critic Albert, Alfred Frankfurter, is one's mixture of excitement and distraction from one great experience of a picture to another. He is the perfect model of the collector who not only buys works of art, but also loves and therefore understands them. For the public at large, however, without access, the Chester Dale collection remained a tantalizing mystery praised in the press and viewed fleetingly in exhibitions. Dale would eventually find a permanent home for his collection in the newly established National Gallery of Art in Washington, beginning with a series of loans in 1941 and followed by a series of gifts starting in 1942. The extraordinary, if difficult, collector slowly developed a cautious relationship with the fledgling museum, even serving as its president. Nevertheless, the ultimate fate of this remarkable collection remained uncertain until his death in 1962, when it was real that Dale had bequeathed to the National Gallery the bulk of his still substantial collection of modern art, comprising an additional 228 paintings, seven sculptures, 23 works on paper, making it among the single most important and valuable gift ever given to the National Gallery of Art. His gift came with two stipulations. First, that his works be displayed in a suite of galleries bearing his name, a condition no doubt inspired by the Commando collection he had so admired in his early days as a collector. And second, that the paintings in his collection never be lent, therefore ensuring the visitors to the gallery would never be deprived of the pleasure of seeing the works that Dale so clearly loved. What began as a lark and a hobby soon became an all-consuming passion for De Dale that spanned decades. The resulting collection is as complex as the man who assembled it, reflecting his particular biases and peculiar perspectives as much as intelligence and discernment. It is not the most um, adventurous of collections. It is not groundbreaking in that sense. What it is most known for and most reputable for is the quality and the quantity of the collection. The 307 works that came to the National Gallery literally became the founding collection of the National Gallery of Art for modern art. And unfortunately, because of his restriction, you can only see this collection by coming to Washington. And I invite all of you to come to Washington. This was my sales pitch to invite all of you. And please do come, and you will be able to see these beautiful paintings in much nicer spaces than they are in these photographs. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you.